Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CMC Markets Monthly Live Non-Farm Payrolls Analysis Webinar featuring myself, Colin Sedinsky, and Michael Hewson. We're, uh, we're here today to uh, discuss non-farm payrolls, but there's also a lot of other things to talk about. It's been a really busy day for news in the markets. We have a, uh, we've had the uh, UK election results. We've also had trade data from, uh, from China. So there's a, uh, really a lot going on, and uh, let's jump right in. I'm going to start off with our, uh, our disclaimers. Our, uh, we'll read our West warning here. Uh, we'll start. This video is for general information only and is not intended to provide trading or investment advice or any personal recommendations. The information in this video is indicative and may become out of date at any given time. CMC Markets shall not be responsible for any loss that you incur either directly or indirectly arising from any investment based on any information in this video. Past performance does not guarantee future returns. Spread bending and trading CFDs can carry significant risks due to rapidly moving markets and may not be suitable to all investors. Losses can exceed your initial deposit. We therefore recommend you seek independent advice and ensure you fully understand the risks involved before trading. You do not own or have any interest in the underlying assets. CMC products are only available in jurisdictions where CMC is registered or exempt from registration. We are not in the United States or any other jurisdiction where they are not permitted. This video is for general information only. And uh, CMC Markets Canada is a member of IROC and CITF, and uh, we act as dealer and agent of CMC Markets UK PLC. CMC Markets is an execution-only dealer who does not provide investment advice or recommendations. So that concludes that, and I will, uh, I'll close out this. Here and I'm going to just close out of this because I don't want these windows popping up. I should have done this earlier. My apologies. And now we're on to our screen. So uh, perhaps, Michael, why don't we uh, we begin here with the uh, UK 100 and the big moves we've had uh, overnight? This is a pretty uh, substantial pop that we've had in the market on the election results. And I'm actually going to uh, take my one minute chart here and bring it out a little farther to show you what I saw at um, late yesterday afternoon. Let's just bring it a little farther here with this big jump up at, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's important to put to the it. context of this move into what the expectations were um, 24 hours ago, when I think a lot of people were thinking that Ed Miliband um, would probably end up, um, you know, at least having a decent chance of becoming prime minister. The exit polls proved very quickly that that was so far from the truth to really not be that funny, but um, we saw a massive spike in the pound. The FTSE future, as we can see, also spiked higher. Um, and this morning, we've really, really kicked on. We've kicked on across a whole host of sectors, transport, banking, energy, um, and housing. And um, I think it just underscores how nervous markets were about certain elements of the Labour Party manifesto because essentially we've got every single FTSE 100 stock up today bar one and that's Pearson's owner of the FT. Well, I think it's slightly left-leaning anyway, so that's probably the market's um, uh, revenge on the FT. Um, FTSE 250 has made a record high. Um, so what we're getting now is a bit of a relief rally on the back of what I would suggest is nine months, six to nine months of an awful lot of uncertainty and deadlocked polls. Yes, absolutely. And you can see here where I circled when the, uh, when the, when the market closed, uh, sorry, when the polls closed yesterday at 10 o'clock p.m. in London was 5 p.m. Eastern time. And you can see pretty quickly right afterwards, this is a five minute chart. Look at these two big gaps here. And then we just steadily trended higher right through the night. In the last couple of hours now, we've seen that, seen it level off a little bit. We're back above 7,000 for the FTSE. This is about a 69.80 to, let's call it 70.40 uh, trading range here for the uh, for the FTSE. So leveling off and is starting to uh, digest gains. Let's do cable while we're uh, while we're on this topic, Michael. I'll just pop it up here. And, uh, and it's showing us here also, again, we look at the daily chart. Uh, cable had been working its way higher, coming up out of almost a double bottom back here. It was hanging around 152.15 when the polls closed. And, uh, and once again, you can see this big gap here. It really shot up when we were, uh, when we were watching this right when the, uh, when the polls closed. Uh, pretty quickly, these exit polls came in. And, and it's really intriguing because conservatives tend to poll low pretty much everywhere around the world. This isn't un un uncommon. It happens here in Canada, it happens with the Republicans in the States, and, and, and clearly with, with the Conservatives in the UK and, uh, and elsewhere. But, uh, but I, this was uh, quite a surprise, really, when you, uh, when you think about it. 
Yeah, but I think there's a number of factors at play, and I think what really tipped people towards the Conservatives was that um, interview on Sky News. It was the audience debates. You wouldn't have seen it, Colin, but over here, each party leader was quizzed by um, individual members of a selected audience in Leeds um, a couple of weeks ago, and they all got a bit of a kicking, all three of them, but Miliband, Ed Miliband in particular, basically got lambasted for, his, for the fact that he could not admit and would not admit that the Labour Party spent too much in the previous government. And I think that sort of thing resonates with people. I think it basically tells people that they can't be trusted on the economy because if they can't admit their past mistakes, who's to say they won't make new ones? So what we're seeing at the moment is a bit of a topping cable around about 155, 155.20, um, potentially a double top. It's only, a potential, it's only potentially a double top um, if we uh, break below 151, which was basically the reaction lows that we saw at the beginning of this week. But at the moment, we've broken above the 50-day moving average. We're above the 100-day moving average. First time that's happened since May last year. And the next key resistance is the 200-day moving average, which is around about 155.70, which is roughly... Um, around about the same sorts of levels that we saw um, I think earlier this year we've got three peaks I think you've just drawn a line straight across the top there Colin um, around about between 155 and 155 and a half pretty much where we are now so that's a really really key level there and I think it's also important to mention that there's a dollar story in this as well um, non-farm payrolls out later to this afternoon and um, it's all about expectations because this rally in the pound, I think, has also been um, a little bit of a rally in the euro as well. Um, we've seen euro dollar punch higher and potentially we could well go higher in that towards 115. At the moment, the euro dollar is suffering a little bit on the back of the stronger pound against the euro and that's getting pushed down. But overall, that weak ADP number this week um, was the sixth successive um, not well, it, it was a sixth successive monthly decline in annual jobs gained in the part since November. Since November, the number of jobs added has been lower than the previous month. So there's a definite trend um, taking place there. And the big question, I think, for me really is whether or not that manifests itself into a similar sort of trend for non farm payrolls. Everyone's looking at the unemployment rate, but every other indicator that I've been looking at seems to suggest there's a little bit of weakness in the US economy. So, you know, let, let's, I think we've got to look at what the expectations are. That March payrolls number of 126 was a real shock. So we'll be looking for a, rev a revision in that number, an upward revision. More importantly than that, the 224,000 number that we're expecting for this month could actually come in lower or could we get a strong bounce back because of the weak March number. So these are all the factors that we've got to weigh up. We're expecting 220, 224. I'm calling it around about 181. And strangely enough, um, Colin is actually calling it very, very similar to me, which frightens me a little bit. It's scary. You and I are pretty much exactly because I, I called for uh, 180 and a, a 10K upward revision to the previous month. So you and I, have, I think this is since we started doing this, this is the first time, this is the closest you and I have come in our estimates. I mean, we've been off by you know, the, the differences of, say, five or 10, but uh, this is the first time we've been, we've been pretty much dead on, which uh, makes me wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, indeed. But I think what we've, what, you know, what we've got to decide is what, what, a, what, a, what a number means for the U.S. dollar. You yeah. know, what a strong number means for the U.S. dollar or what a weak number means for the U.S. dollar. Certainly, I think the data that we've seen thus far this week, the trade balance, again, points to significantly weak Q1. But more importantly than that, that weak ADP number for April, um, as well as other data that we've seen for April in the ISM manufacturing, also points to a weak beginning of Q2. So you, I think you can pretty much rule out a June rate hike. And I think the odds are... And I think that the odds are diminishing potentially on a September one as well. But I think a lot will depend on obviously the number that comes out in about five minutes' time. Yes, and, and something I wanted to mention on that, Michael, is uh, keeping an eye on the on the stock market and the dollar because uh, for the first time in, in a while we've seen this week that they've actually been going in the same direction. It used to be that uh, if you had like if you say you had a weak jobs number 
uh, the economy would, uh, sorry, the stock, the U.S. dollar would go down, and the stock market would take off because they say, oh well, the Fed's going to put off, uh, put off uh, tightening. But now what we saw, especially with the uh, ADP number, was that what ended up happening was the U.S. dollar, of course, went down on the Fed being pushed off. And the U.S. stocks went down because people started saying, oh, well, does that mean the economy is slow? And what does that mean for corporate earnings? So the, uh, the, it's changed a little bit there in terms of how the, uh, how the market's been reacting. We, we've gone up into this point, uh, into a position where the markets are basically going sideways. And, and what we've seen in, in recent months is that both bulls and bears have been able to take a reading out of, out of any number we got. So, for example, if we came in with another weak number, the, uh, you could say that uh, so the uh, – the people that are bearish on the dollar would say, okay, well, the Fed's not going to raise rates any anytime soon, so the dollar is going to go down. But in the stock market, does, do they take that as, well, is that good for liquidity or is that bad for corporate earnings? And, and so we're seeing the markets kind of grind sideways. So it is possible you could see some choppiness and some trading in both directions off this news because nobody's really been able to take control of the markets for very long. We are in a sideways trend, and that makes it more of a uh, – of a trader's market these days. And I'll just bring yeah. up the, uh, the Dow very quickly on here yeah. to show we're what in, I we're mean. In a, yeah, we're in a sideways range, which we're basically means, range. and we're at a flat bang in the middle of it. So at the moment, with respect to the S&P, we could go either way, which leads me to stay a little bit clear of it because sim simply speaking, it could go towards the top end of its range above 2110, or it could go to the bottom end of its range near 2065, 2060. So, but I think European markets are slightly different in that there does, does appear to be some evidence that we may have seen a top in the DAX. We posted a bullish, in, but we posted a bearish engulfing week a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago on the DAX, and we also posted a bearish engulfing month on the DAX as well. And um, I did a video on that earlier this week. Um, we also did exactly the same thing on the German Bund. A bearish engulfing month and a bearish engulfing week, and it also coincided with a bullish engulfing month on euro dollar. So for me, there's a significant amount of correlation between DAX, Bund, and euro, and all of those indicators are telling me that we could potentially see a higher euro over the course of the next few weeks and months, and a lower DAX and a lower Bund. And I certainly think some of this week's price action has been symptomatic of of those particular trades being somewhat one way, and we've seen a significant unwinding of that trade. Um, so, I mean, you, you may have a different take on that. And certainly seeing UK markets are now starting to come off their highest levels of the day. They're slipping back. Um, so I think there's a little bit of profit taking coming off ahead of these payrolls numbers. But certainly a good number. Um, anything over and above 240, 250 is going to be dollar positive, which could see the euro and the pound push lower. Anything, I think, below 200 is going to be a disappointment and is going to be dollar negative. And I think that's something that, um, you know, we need, to bear, we need to bear in mind when looking at the particular markets. For me, the key levels, I think, on, on euro dollar is obviously um, roughly just below where we are now, around about 112. That could well act as a key support area on the downside. Um, if you look at the chart forums on Spreadbet, I usually do a daily analysis on the key major currencies, um, identifying where the key support areas are. Um, so if you want to catch up with that, always have a quick look on the chart forums. But certainly, I think there's a nice little channel line support on euro dollar coming in pretty much just below where we are right now, around about... Um, just, just, just below the one, the one twelve area. Okay, here we go. We have about fifteen seconds to the uh, to the numbers coming out here. So I've brought back up the uh, the dollar index trend. There we go. There's the uh, U.S. dollar starting to drop. One eleven seventy is what I'm looking at as a bit of a support area. We're getting a little bit of uh, dollar weakness, and the number, number is. Okay, 223 on farms, 85 revision, and a downward revision to March to 85,000. So that's a re that's a really significant revision. So that's a significant downward revision, and then the, and, then, and then the big rebound in April. And the and unemployment rate of 5.4. 5.4% as, as expected for the uh, for that. So we've got. U.S. dollar dropping. It looks to me as though people are responding first to the um, to the downward think, revision. Yeah, the, 
Well, if the dollar's gone slightly big. Because if you took that out, because if you took that out, that's a 40K downward revision. So if you knocked 40K off this, then you'd, then you'd be a 180. So that's, uh, yeah, so it still seems a little bit soft on, on the soft side to me on balance. I'm going to bring up the S&P chart here and let's see what yeah. stocks are doing. So we are getting a spike on the S&P, but again, it's all extended. It's going back to 2100 and being contained by the middle of this trading channel here. So if we look at the S&P, we've got a, it's a, a, a 2050, 2040 to 2120, and more recently it's been about uh, 2075 to again to about 2120. There's 2100 level here for the S&P has been fairly significant and it's just barely gotten above it and kind of stalling out again. So let's take a quick look here at what the Dow is doing. And then I'll bring up the Euro dollar. So we've got the Dow spike in the Dow back up above 18,000, running into resistance about 18,090, slipping back into this 1852 to, uh, to 70 area. And now I'll bring up uh, Euro dollar. Let's bring up Euro dollar here. So again, US dollar weakness spike in the Euro. It's cleared 112.50 and is moving up into this 112.60 to 112.90 uh, kind of range. And let's bring up gold as well. Gold also jumping on the U.S. dollar. Had been steady above about 1184 to 1188. It's broken out over that. Back above 1190, settling out about 1192. Still short of 1200 on gold, though. So gold is still uh, still struggling here in this uh, in the bottom half of this 1180 to 1220 uh, kind of trading range here. And I'm just taking a look here at the Canada jobs. Canada jobs was a loss of 19,000. And uh, we had, but again, we've got this mix here. We've got a 46,000 increase in full-time, 66,000 decrease in part-time. So a bit of a recovery in Canada jobs. And we'll just bring up uh, dollar CAD and, uh, and see what's going on with that one. We have dollar CAD is plunging, which is the US dollar weakening. So it's taken out this uh, 12090 back in and around 12050 or 12060. And if I look at the bigger chart here for dollar CAD, it's got this big support zone in and around 119, 119 uh, 50 to 120. You've got a round number, you've got a double bottom, you've got a Fibonacci level, 38% uh, retracement. So that's where you could see some, uh, some support. But RSI is also showing the downtrend for dollar CAD does remain intact here. So uh, overall, it looks like the, uh, the initial reaction has been uh, dollar negative, uh, figuring that this will put off the, uh, the U.S., the Fed from, uh, from raising rates in June to, I, I say, September at least. And I think, Michael, you'd agree on that probably even later and because uh, you're still calling for next year. So certainly, certainly nothing with the Fed before September. Knocking the dollar down, we are seeing the U.S. stocks bounce back. But they still seem to be contained within their uh, within their current trading ranges. We've also seen a downward revision to the January number from 239 to 201. So basically, you've got a 38,000 downward revision to January. You've seen a 41 downward revision to um, March, and 223,000 is pretty much what we've got of a downward revision. Um, sorry, a downward a slight downward miss um on the on expectations for um for this month as well i mean it's pretty much coming as expected unemployment's dipped but the participation rate has actually um has has actually um gone up ever so slightly to 62.8 so year on year wages have gone up to 2.2 .2. we were expecting a rise to 2.3 so again that's a little bit soft So, so, all uh, all, so, all in, so all in all, it's been a little bit of a, what I would call a little bit of a, a disappointing jobs report. Looking at the headline, the headline numbers look particularly good, but the revisions um, have been disappointing on the downward um, slant in, in the same way that ADP um, saw some significant downward revisions to previous months. So, you know, I think with respect to that, it paints a rather disappointing picture of the US economy in Q1, and I think it probably means that we're going to get downward revisions to Q1 GDP, but more importantly than that, we're not really seeing a significant bounce back in Q2, and I think that's more 
than anything, I think that's more than anything, a little bit worrying, certainly in the context of dollar bulls, because everyone has been thinking about, well, it's not a matter of, um, you know, it's, a, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And now it's really a question of, well, actually, are we going to see one this year? And the odds on that seem to be getting pushed out, although I know you probably would disagree with that, Colin. Uh, well, I do. I, I do. I still think they're probably going to try and do one at, at, at later in the year, kind of like what, what, they, what they did with tapering, where they got one in right at the end of the year to kind of say they did it this year. But uh, increase, but uh, certainly it looks to me like the case for June is, is pretty much dead here. And um, I still think they may try and have a go at it later in the year, but we'd be looking now in, in the last three meetings of the year between September and, uh, and December, certainly not as, uh, as early as it had been looking previously. I've been watching the... Uh, I think oh, sorry, watching September's looking a little. I think September's looking a little September's bit looking as well. too. <laughs> Yeah, it is. To be honest, like I said, I mean, we may end up in a situation where they squeak one in in uh, in December. December. And you and I have talked yeah. about this before, where you know, yeah. I, I, if they do it on December the fifteenth, and I, you know, I know you had said at the beginning of the year they won't raise rates at the beginning of the year. If they do it on December the fifteenth, that's still pretty a good, pretty great call. You yeah. only be off by two weeks. <laughs> Well, yeah, but they might raise rates from January the 1st, so I, in a that sense, too. might be right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm just watching the markets here, and uh, and as we've been talking about how we're in a uh, we're in kind of a sideways trend for the market where nobody's really been able to uh, to take control very long. As we've been I've been watching how the, uh, the what the dollar and the uh, and the Dow have been doing. So we had this spike up of uh, about 100 points in the Dow on the news, it's now starting to retrench and slip back a little bit. And if we look here at the dollar, it's actually had, uh, had, had dropped on the news. It's now gone back above 95 and is actually trading slightly above where it was where it was before the uh, before the numbers came in, and, and this is typical following a non-farm payrolls announcement, where you'll see the market take a big swing in one direction, have a big counter move back in the other direction, and then kind of settle out somewhere. So this is not uh, it, it's not unusual. This is uh, this is typical trading, and uh, but it is indicative of how we are in a in a sideways trend, particularly on stocks, and and both sides are are trying to take a read out of uh, take something away from the uh, from the results here. The, uh, just showing the, the little longer-term dollar index chart here, we have been in a bit of a downtrend, and uh, and essentially to me it looks like it's trying to kind of level off here in this 94 to 96 area. So why we've seen it, this move on uh, up back up to 95 is really just to bounce back up into the middle for the uh, for the dollar index. Yeah, and I think I think it's important to think. You know, is this a dollar positive story? I don't think it is. It's not no, totally either. dollar negative. I think I don't think it's totally dollar negative because we've seen a significant rebound in the euro. We've seen a significant rebound in the pound, and dollar yen continues to look a little bit soft. And yeah, stock markets do look a little bit better bid. Treasuries look a little bit better bid as the yields start to fall. But it, I don't think this is a payrolls number that is really going to get the dollar selling off very, very quickly. At the same time, it's not going to send it skyrocketing higher. So I think what we're going to get today is more testing of the extremes of the range. So with euro dollar looking at around 111.60, 111.70 to find a few bids down there perhaps uh, and maybe retest the highs. Obviously, that's going to be driven by what happens over the course of the next few days with respect to Greece, which given all the news flow that we've seen today has taken a little bit of a back seat. Um, just for a change, and it's a pleasant change, I have to say. But next week on Monday, we're going to be much more focused on Greece again, simply because of the Eurogroup meeting that comes about on Tuesday. So, you know, while we look at this this, this number that we're currently seeing at the moment, it is important. By by, but by Monday, everyone will have forgotten it, and they'll be moving on to something completely different. One thing I saw on Twitter earlier this week was somebody saying, "If I had a dollar." For every uh, Greece's doom story that I've read, I'd have enough money to bail out Greece. Well, that's very true, and I'm sure they'd welcome the extra cash. <laughs> Indeed. Let's take a look at uh, at dollar yen okay. here, Michael. While okay. we've, uh... Oh, sorry. Did you want to say add something? No, I just want to have a quick look at the oil price to see what that's doing. Oh, sure. Why don't we bring up? Uh, you want Brent or to our Texas? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, WTI is fine. Okay. Oh, okay. I brought up Brent, so uh, Brent's, Brent's go for it. No, I mean, we've seen a very significant move higher in Brent crude prices, and I think it's sort of manifest, it's, it's pretty much matched 
in the move higher in WTI. Um, but I think it's, you know, and the fact that we've taken out the previous highs of this year I think is important. But I think a lot of the move that we've seen higher in the oil price has largely been as a result of the weaker dollar. Um, we've got an OPEC meeting coming up in June. I think the, the key level for me, I think, on Brent is $70, $75 a barrel. Why do I say that? Because that was the level at which Brent prices collapsed from in November after OPEC decided not to cut, pro cut production. So that, I think, is going to be a natural barrier. So I think there is a perception that we could well be near a near-term top in crude oil prices. In WTI, that's probably going to be around about $65 a barrel, and I would suggest it's around sort of $70, $75 a barrel in Brent, because I, I think there's a number of uh, shale operations ready to come back online in the event shale prices or oil prices go back above $65 a barrel. You may have a different view on that, Colin, because you're nearer to it and the oil fields of North Dakota, which are yeah, basically on the Canadian the border. Yeah, there's a Yeah, there's several million barrels a day that's just ready to come back on, online at a moment's notice. So I think that will uh, contain any kind of a, uh, a meaningful rebound. And, and on top of that, it's important to remember that when we did see the uh, the U.S. start to cut back production, the Saudis just sopped it all up. They, they ramped up production, and basically the increase in Saudi production was more than the decrease in U.S. production. So we're still in this market share war where whoever does blink and decides to cut first is more likely to find that rather than bringing down total supply, they're more likely to find that somebody else is just going to go in and take that away from them which also is making things difficult. But on top of what I've, I've drawn in here, this uh, channel between 70 and 75, and, and Michael mentioned it, what's also interesting, sitting dead center of that is at uh, 72.50 is the 38% retracement of the decline from June to uh, January. So that's uh, I, I keep Fibonacci retracement level as well. So that does look like a zone where you could, A, in the short term, see it drawn to, but then, B, could contain uh, the uh, the advance. I'm just going to uh, close, uh, bring down Brent for a minute, and uh, and open up the uh, bring up WTI. We can take a look at that one as well. So for uh, for WTI has not come up as much as Brent. Uh, WTI is hanging around the 23% retracement level, which is at 57.90, and it's been struggling with 60 in a in a, in a meaningful way. And interesting, we had this pop up above a uh, 60 for one day. It was a bit of a uh, a bit of a shooting star. This is kind of an ugly uh, candlestick pattern there. That's a nice little shit. That's not, that's um, a great stone doji. Yes, it is. So it's that could actually be a potential reversal pattern. So when we were talking about you know potential top in oil prices, maybe we've already seen it. Yeah, it's a possibility that that, that great stone doji interests me. And then you've broken this trend line here, and now it's starting to contain it as new resistance. That's just today. So we'll see if that. How that plays out, but if I just extend this line up here, you'll see there we had the, the it was it was it's starting to kind of break and retest this uh, this support line here off the uh, off the bottom, which is uh, that's a intriguing. nice line. That's a nice line, that. Yeah. If that if we do see crude start to get contained here below this line, would be confirmation of the Greystone Doji, and. Um, and the three candle pattern here, what, what would we call this one, Michael? You had big up day, gravestone doji, and then a big down day. That's not very pretty. That, that, that's a star. I think it's a, yeah. either a shooting star or an evening star. Yeah. Um, because, you know, if you take the three candles combined. Um, and it yeah. is quite powerful, but it does require confirmation. It requires confirmation. Basically, it needs to go below the lows of the previous day, mm -hmm. um, which in this case... I think it's about 15, 7, 57, 75, which interestingly again is your Fibonacci test too. It's amazing yeah. how these things all come together, and when we when we use Western and Eastern techniques and we try to bring multiple um, types of analysis to bear, it's amazing what happens when they all come together. So if you see uh, Texas break 57, 75, this is going to look awfully ugly technically. Yeah, so it's worth, definitely worth keeping an eye on that. So maybe let's take a quick peek, Michael, at, uh, at dollar yen, and then we can open it up yep. to a couple of questions and wrap up. Sure. Okay. Sounds good to me. Dollar yen, it is. Let's look at dollar yen, and uh, we're seeing some choppiness. Got knocked down to one nineteen sixty, kind of hanging around uh, around one twenty again. I just brought up the bigger chart here to show we're in this sideways channel for uh, 
for yen of about 118, 118, 50 at the low end, about 120, 175, 122 at the high end, 120 big round numbers sitting in the middle, and that's pretty much where we're at. I think we're in a range in dollar yen. Yeah. The top end of it is around about 120, 50. The bottom end of it is roughly around about 118 and a half. And I think it's quite interesting in the context of the range that we've got in the S&P and the Dow. I think you've got a little bit of a mirror going on there with respect to what dollar yen is doing and what stock markets, the U.S. stock markets are doing. Yeah. So let's just take a quick. I'll just take a quick peek here and bring up the uh, the charts for. Uh, for dollar index before we wrap. If anyone has any questions, by the way, please put them up on the chat and we'll uh, we'll take a look. So we had uh, so we saw here dollar a dollar index got knocked down to about 94.40. The uh, the snap back up to uh, stalled out short of 95.20, and now it's kind of leveling off around 95, pretty much where it was before the news. And if I bring up SPX here, so it's just taking a second. There we go. And it had on the, so U.S. stocks. So we did have the uh, the initial rally pop here on SPX from 2090 up to about 2110. It's backed up only really a couple of points. It's still holding nicely above 2100. Big resistance for the S&P is still up about 2120. So it looks as though Michael, the uh, the stocks are actually uh, taking this news a uh, as a, as a moderately positive, although they're still contained within their ranges, and the uh, yeah. the dollar is looking like it's kind of taking this as neutral right now. Pretty much the same. It's tried both ends of the range. Euro dollar is now back above 112. It did it did it, it did pop below there around to what, about 111.70.80. You know, which again is where we found um, a little bit of support. So I think we're probably going to well, I think we're probably going to fizzle out the rest of this um, this trading week. On the back of those payrolls numbers, and I think inevitably we're going to we're going to shift back onto um, shift back onto the uh, the next announcement and then and the next key market driver, which is likely to be next week. Yes, it's looking that way. So I'll just finish up here. I'm going to bring cable back up and, uh, okay, and I'm, going to, I'm going to I'm going to duck out now, Colin, because I've got a few I've, I've got a few things to sort out. But, okay, um, no problem. But thanks, guys, and um, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask Colin or either contact either him or myself on Twitter. Excellent. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, Cheers, do we have Colin. any questions? Cheers. Do we have any questions for anybody today before I, uh, I wrap up here? No questions? Okay. Well, thank you all very much for joining us today. It's been a big week. We do expect to see uh, continued action in the UK markets in the wake of uh, yesterday, last, last night and today's uh, election results. And, and as Michael said, there's certainly uh, more going on in, uh, in Europe next week. So we could, uh, we could also continue to see some, uh, some positioning relative to that. We, uh, we may see some uh, trading back and forth this afternoon on the, uh, the oil price. We do have the, uh, rate count for the U.S. coming out at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, which is 6 o'clock p.m. British summer time. And, uh, and that's the main one. Okay, sorry, I do have some questions here. Gold is in an inverse head and shoulders. Yes, it is. And Kiwi dollar is in the double bottom on the weekly, and so is the euro dollar. Why isn't the D dollar index falling? So I'll, uh, I'll just quickly here, I'll show, we did talk about uh, gold. I'll show the inverse head and shoulders here. Which I actually do have marked out on my uh, on my chart here. So we do we've had a left shoulder here around 1180, the head down around 1140, and we carved out a bit of a shoulder here around 1180. The neckline is at 1220, and uh, and gold is kind of struggling here to uh, to get much higher. And uh, but we have seen, and, and really considering how much the U.S. dollar has weakened, we are seeing that gold is is really struggling to make much headway. Uh, despite that, if I bring up uh, Kiwi dollar here. Which I'll be happy to talk to. I'll also show Aussie dollar because I haven't shown that one yet. We did have a nice double bottom on Kiwi dollar. We've seen a rally up. We actually got a smaller double top here, and it's been backing away from it. We're uh, we're sliding back towards 74 cents. So 74 is the retest here. We've seen Kiwi dollar actually break this uh, 
this momentum line here. So we had upward momentum on Kiwi dollar. It broke 50 and it broke this trend line. It's turning downward. The momentum has been turning downward. The, the test here now is at 74. If it holds 74, then we are seeing still a, a base building pattern. If it fails 74, we could get a retest of these lows back near about 70 cents again. The big question on, on Kiwi dollar really is RBNZ right now is uh, are they serious about possibly starting to cut interest rates? If they want to do it, they certainly have rooms to do so. They raised interest rates four times last year for a, a total of about 1% when everybody else was going the other way. So uh, they do have room, and I think that's what's containing Kiwi dollar right now. Uh, on, the, on the flip side of that was the, uh, the rebound we've been getting in, uh, in Aussie dollar, which I'll just show here briefly over the last couple of days. Similarly, we had a, a, a double bottom here, almost a triple bottom in Aussie dollar. It's, however, been able to maintain its momentum and, and has kept going, working its way higher. The 78, 78, 30 has become a, a higher support zone, and it's basically been holding up. Currently, rallies for Aussie dollar contained in this 80, 60 to 81 area. We did see things slip back a bit. I do think if you started to see the uh, it creep back up higher, say up to this 80, 80, the uh, RBA might start to get concerned again in a, in a big way because they cut interest rates. Amazingly enough, they actually cut interest rates, and and the Aussie dollar went up. That's because a lot of people think they're done now, having uh, having got down towards two percent. People are starting to think that uh, perhaps they'll go neutral, and that the uh, RBNZ might be the more likely one to uh, to start to cut rates. And interesting, we'll show this on the on Aussie Kiwi here, which was getting prayed, which got right down almost to parity for the uh, the New Zealand dollar. Uh, maybe what had spooked the, N the RBNZ into uh, starting to think, talk about cutting interest rates, because uh, in, in the last little while, though, we've seen this uh, change substantially, that it's uh, we had a real rally in Aussie dollar relative to, uh, to New Zealand dollar, some of which is New Zealand dollar really re uh, relative weakness here at the uh, at the moment. And uh, sorry, the other one we had, the euro dollar. So why isn't the US dollar falling? Uh, going back to this, I think what we're seeing is uh, is overall here that the uh, US dollar has probably, has already come down in the last couple of weeks from 100 down to 94. So my feeling is that you've probably already seen it get uh, the uh, weaker jobs report uh, getting priced into US dollar, which is probably why we're not seeing it come down more. The headline number was, even though there was, there's been downward revisions, the headline number itself was uh, was strong enough to uh, to uh, bring in some support here in the uh, in the near term and, and basically to keep it range uh, range bound for the, uh, the U.S. dollar. Although as I know, if you if you factor out the uh, the downward revision to the previous month, then uh, 40k of that 223k was was the uh, was the offset of the downward revision. So you had a so you had a good a good rebound here for the uh, for the non-farm payrolls for uh, for this month, and that's been enough to uh, to provide some support here, and and as I noted, the the gold uh, gold in uh, in particular with the reverse head and shoulders is a uh, it is a problem here, right? We we should be seeing between the uh, the euro stimulus and the weakening euro doll, uh, U.S. dollar, gold should be uh, should be blasting through that 1220, and it's just not at uh, at this point in time. So it's one we've got to uh, keep an eye on. It's it's gone range bound like uh, a lot of other markets. Do we have any final questions? Okay, I'm going to conclude here then. Uh, as, as Michael noted, feel free everyone to uh, to contact us on Twitter if you have any more uh, questions after the call. We'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. Michael and I will be back a little later this month with our uh, monthly analyst debates conference call and then back again uh, next month for U.S. non-firm payrolls. Have a great day of trading, everyone. <laughs>